Hey, book lovers. My name is M, and I want to talk about books and cats. So I have something new coming to Books and Cats in February. I am in the middle of putting it together right now, and I am so excited. So stay tuned for more info on that. And also, don't forget that if you hang around after the music at the end of the episode, uh, you can hear a new chapter of Heart of the Storm, which is my weekly writing experiment. It keeps me consistent. It's not super edited, but I think it's entertaining, I hope. If you haven't started listening yet, the story starts in episode 17 of the podcast. So I mentioned this briefly in the last episode, but I have created a to-read bookshelf. I've never had an actual to-read pile before, but my Book of the Month membership keeps the new books coming in, and the more I read up about other books, the more I find that I want to add to my pile. So I took a day and I cleared a shelf in the living room where I always have to look at it, um, so I can always kind of be thinking about what I want to read next. Plus that kind of, it's exciting, you know? And I am planning to only put books on it that I am going to read. So it's about three quarters full, which seemed a little daunting, um, but like I said, also exciting. And then the very next day I ended up adding three more. It was kind of just the timing of the delivery, but it made me laugh. I don't think that shelf will ever be empty, and I am pretty excited about that. Now I just have to choose which one is next. But for now, let's talk about this week's book, which is The Winter Sister by Megan Collins. This was one of my book of the month books last year that somehow got skipped over and it got buried on a bookshelf, um, which was why I needed the to read shelf. I had to take them from various places around my house and consolidate them into one place. <laughs> um, so I found this book stuffed on a shelf um, and I added it to the pile. And then I just decided to read it next because it had winter in the title and we're, you know, right in the middle of January and it's getting cold. This morning it was negative two at my house. Um, kind of a dumb reason to pick a book, but it ended up being a great book, so no complaints. So this book is full of complications. Um, there's complications in the relationships between the characters. There's complications in the family both past and present. There's complications in a murder investigation with the police and politics and a cold case. Um, it's a murder mystery, but it's less of a thriller and more, it's more of an emotional look at relationships and memories, which slowly unfold throughout the story. The whodunit part was kind of hinted at and not terribly surprising, but again, it was more about the characters and how they each did their part to lead to Persephone's death, and how they lived with it afterwards. So Persephone is the main character. She was 17 when she died, and the story is told from the point of view of her sister Sylvie, who was 14 at the time. I love the characters in this book. Um, there's a lot of secrets and pain and layers, but there's also a sort of funny, scary, weird character that breaks the tension and seems to know everyone's secrets. But anyway, let's talk about the plot. Persephone and Sylvie lived with their mom, who was a strong single mother, uh, a waitress, and a hard worker. She did have a strange monthly dark day where she would disappear into her room for the entire day and not respond to her daughters. But there's also no doubt that she loves her girls. Um, she has very strict rules about dating um, and strict rules about other things. And while Sylvie is always willing to comply with her mother's wishes, Persephone was equally always testing her limits and rebelling. She would sneak out at night to meet her boyfriend, Ben, who is the son of the most wealthy and prominent family in their town. Sylvie didn't like it, but she kept all of her sister's secrets. Then Persephone doesn't come home, and it doesn't take long for her body to be discovered. And Sylvie's world is completely turned upside down. Her mom begins drinking so much that she vanishes behind her locked bedroom door. 
and Sylvia's left to depend on her Aunt Jill for survival. Sylvia escapes for a while. She attends RISD and lands a job in a tattoo parlor after college. She's not happy, but she has space between her and her mother. But now her mom has cancer. Aunt Jill has been taking care of her mother, but her own daughter is about to give birth, so Sylvie's tasked with returning to her childhood home to take care of her mother. Back in her hometown, there is no avoiding the memories, the questions, and the regrets surrounding her sister's unsolved murder. She runs into several people who were in some way involved that night, and slowly, as Sylvie pieces together the events of that evening, the things a 14-year-old didn't know at the time, she begins to see how everyone played their part in her sister's death. But the ending is still surprising. I liked this book a lot. While it was a murder mystery, the pace was a little slower, and I liked that it focused on the relationships surrounding Persephone and her death. I'm very interested in psychology and family dynamics, as well as family secrets and cold cases, so this was a good pick for me. Not bad considering I picked it just for the title. Um, I don't want to say anything else, I don't want to give anything away, but I would highly recommend reading The Winter Sister by Megan Collins. It was so good. So now I'm going to take a quick break, and when I come back, we are going to talk about my cat's latest kill, and why cats bring you dead animals. Be right back. Hey, cat lovers. Are you looking for a special treat for your favorite furry friends? Petsmarket.org has everything that your pet needs. They're crazy pet lovers located in Colorado Springs, and their store offers you a wide variety of unique pet merchandise, providing you better ways of caring for your pet at the best prices. Go to Petsmarket.org, that's dot O-R-G, and use code EMSBOOKS20 for 20% off your order. That's E-M apostrophe S, books 20. You can find the link and the code in the show notes. Whether it's an adorable new bow tie, medications to keep them healthy, or a stylish new water bowl, you can find everything your pet needs at PetSmarket.org. And we're back. So, Sasser's caught a huge mouse the other day, like huge. She's not a big cat. She's not really fully grown yet. Uh, and it looked like it was as big as her face. Um, she was bringing it upstairs to show us when I saw her with it. And I immediately freaked out because that's what I do near mice. I cannot control it in any way. Um, and this one was huge. I was very happy for her though, because she has been scoping it out for like a week beforehand. Um, and she seemed so proud to catch it. We always have a couple of mice during the winter, and luckily now we have an indoor hunter. Strudel was always our only huntress, um, but she mainly hunts outside and then we'll bring them in the house, and sometimes they're not dead, which isn't, you know, great, but that's okay. <laughs> but that happens. Uh, so now we have one for the outside and one for the inside, and any mice around our house do not stand a chance. Um, my boy cats are no help at all. They like to watch the mice. Uh, they get really excited, and they'll play with them once they're dead, but they're not at all good at catching them. Still funny and fun to watch, though. I just can't have them too close, because then I, I scream. I just, it's like a compulsion. I cannot help it or stop it. And of course, the cats always want to bring me their newest kill, because, you know, lucky mom. Um, I hate being that stereotype, because I like to consider myself a fairly tough chick, but mice really freak me out. <laughs> Okay, so I looked up an article on why cats bring you dead animals. And there's going to be a link to it in the show notes if you want to read more. So even though they were domesticated nearly 10,000 years ago, cats have retained a uh, keen hunting sense, as well as a simple gut that allows them to digest raw meat. Lovely. Um, many cats don't eat their prey, and sometimes they don't even kill it. Strudel. <laughs> Spayed female cats are the most likely to bring gory gifts to their owners. But there's a reason for this. In the wild, cat mothers teach their young how to eat their food by bringing home dead or injured prey. Domestic cats are no different. But in this modern age of spayed domestic cats, many female felines have no young to whom they need to pass on their hunting wisdom. I guess the boy cats don't have to be good at hunting. That's funny. Um, by leaving a dead animal on the back porch, your cat is acting out its natural role as mother and teacher. You, her loving owner, represent her surrogate family. 
Aw. And frankly, she knows you would never have been able to catch that delicious mouse on your own. I definitely wouldn't. I always feel so bad when we have to take the mice away from them when I made my husband take it away from Sasser's the other night. And she just looked so bewildered and sad and just couldn't figure out what had happened to it. And I felt bad. I mean, she spent a week hunting that thing. It was amazing. So that is why your kitty friends like to bring you dead animals, which is very sweet. It's because they love you. So now it's time for the quote of the week. This week's quote is from the playwright George Bernard Shaw, who I vaguely remember studying in my college theater courses, but he's not really my style. Um, but I was looking for quotes about families by writers, which may not have always been the kindest, but usually tend to be the most realistic. And I liked this quote. If you cannot get rid of the family skeleton, you may as well make it dance. Make it dance, book lovers. Life is too short. Um, so that is all for this episode. Please subscribe and leave a review if you haven't. Um, it really helps me out a lot. And also check out the Books and Cats merch. The link is in the bio. And show some love for the podcast. And remember, if you hang on after the music, you can hear Chapter 4 of Heart of the Storm. Thank you so much for listening, and please send any book recommendations or fun cat stories or cat facts uh, to books.cats.pod at gmail.com. And until next time, keep reading. Okay, so let's do a quick recap of Chapter 3. Kevo is severely ill after their visit to the strange store, and Harper uses her magic to heal him. Meanwhile, Gemma has discovered spells that keep her from entering the muscle house, and she is kidnapped by an unseen person. Chapter 4 The number one lesson, the thing you must absolutely remember, do not get caught. Gemma opened her eyes and quickly shut them again. The light was blinding. She was on a table, and the light was coming from above. She turned her head to the side and opened her eyes. Peekaboo, said the man whose face was only inches from her own. She jerked back and rocked the table. She heard the sound of metal objects clattering to the floor. The man laughed and ran a hand over his perfectly groomed beard. His hair was a bright shock of orange, but his beard was darker more of a rusted hue. Relax, he said with a chuckle. You're safe. Just try to lay still. Gemma felt a searing pain in her side. She looked down at the body she could barely feel. A patch of blood had seeped through her t-shirt and stained the white sheet that partially covered her bare legs. Her pants were in a ripped and tangled heap on the floor. They had been sliced with scissors, and Gemma remembered feeling the cold air on her skin. Now she felt nothing at all. She realized, numbly, that she was hovering over her body. She tipped her head to one side and examined the vessel in which she dwells. Her skin was ashen and mottled with dried blood. Her legs were exposed to the freezing air, and her skin prickled with tiny goosebumps. Her shirt was pushed up on one side to expose a long, nasty slice up the length of her torso. She clenched her phantom fists in anger, when she noticed that the tattoo of ravens taking off along her side had been dissected. It was her greatest accomplishment, and now it was ruined. Just like everything else. The man laughed and smoothed his impeccable beard again. He drew back his hand and slapped her hard. Gemma felt the hint of the sting. Her body lay motionless below her. The man stared down at her. Then slowly, he raised his eyes to stare into the place where Gemma hovered overhead. His grin grew wide, and the flash of white teeth through his burnt orange beard glinted in the too bright light. He shook his head slowly and chuckled. The sound made Gemma's insides crawl. He took something from the small silver tray and wrapped a piece of green rubber tubing around her arm. Get back in your body, idiot, the man said gruffly as he slid the syringe into her skin and pushed the plunger down a little too aggressively. Gemma was caught in a sucking black hole over her body, and snapped back into a horrible consciousness a moment later. 
The man hovered over her, a dark shadow against the bright overhead lights. He held up a sharp, shiny scalpel and touched it lightly to her cheek. No more of that, love, he said with a bright, toothy grin. You're going to feel every minute of this. He pressed harder with the scalpel, and there was a sudden prick of pain, and she felt the wetness on her cheek and smelled the unmistakable, metallic scent of blood. Her blood. Harper rubbed her hands rapidly over her eyes, trying to comprehend what was coming out of Kevo's mouth. So you sold me out to Mina because she said she was going to save me. Are you stupid? Kevo's expression darkened at her words, and he crossed his muscled arms over his chest. He had pulled on a fresh muscle house gym shirt and joggers. His eyes still bore some of the dazed, glassy look he'd had upon leaving the store, but Clarity was returning slowly. Harper sighed and ran her fingers through her tangled hair. She yanked hard, enjoying the brief, sharp pain that followed. Kevo lowered his arms and dropped into a chair. He rested his face in his hands. Harper felt a stab of guilt. He had no idea what he was in for when he signed on to train her. He thought she was the usual scared young woman looking to learn some simple self-defense. He didn't know how dangerous it was to be her friend. I'm sorry, she said. That was uncalled for. It's been a long night. He nodded and slapped his thighs a few times. He stood up quickly and disappeared into the back office behind the desk. Moments later, he returned with a black metal box. It was smooth and shiny and seamless. And there was something powerful inside. Harper could feel the air vibrating around it, magnified by the metal and producing a low, intriguing hum. She had to know what was inside. Every cell in her body was screaming out for it, like it was a missing piece of her. She reached out, but Kevo stepped back and shook his head. Wait, he said. Not yet. You need to be stronger. Harper tried to hide her annoyance. Whatever was in that box belonged to her. She could feel it. Kevo smiled. It won't be much longer, but there is someone you have to meet first. A clap of distant thunder echoed outside. The lights flickered. Kevo's grin widened. They're here, he said. A burst of nervous butterflies exploded in her belly. A fine sheen of sweat covered her skin and sent a chill up her spine. The air was alive with electricity. A second, louder clap of thunder shook the building, and the gym was plunged into darkness. A bright flash of lightning struck nearby and illuminated the silhouette of two figures standing at the door. The man with the shock of flaming hair adjusted Gemma's motionless body. He smoothed her hair back away from her forehead and turned to the silver tray. He carefully selected a pair of thin, pointed scissors that flashed silver in the bright overhead lights. He poured over her head and selected a thick handful of hair. With a couple of quick, aggressive snips, he hacked away a chunk of hair and let it fall to the floor. He returned to the tray and picked up a razor. He flipped the switch and it leapt to life in his hand. He carefully zipped away the remaining hair, leaving an exposed patch of skin and the shortest of stubble. The next part took slow, careful preparation. There were powders to mix, words to speak, and a dangerously sharp silver blade the length of his palm. He anointed the tip of the blade in a paste made from powders, and a vial of pungent alcohol that he'd purchased from the wretched little liquor store near the gym. He'd had to abandon watch of Gemma for a bit, but he knew he would always find her somewhere near the muscle house. She closely followed the other girl's predictable pattern. Easy to find. The paste turned the steel an inky blue, and he waited for the drip to fall before moving back to Gemma's waiting form. He placed the anointed tip in the center of the bare patch of skin and pressed down. And that, book lovers, is the end of Chapter 4 of Heart of the Storm. Um, I hope you're enjoying it. If you have any ideas, criticisms, suggestions, whatever you want, send them to books.cats.pod at gmail. And until next time, keep reading.